Good evening, and welcome to another Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church's Wednesday night Bible studies that we do. And about a 20 minute study here. And tonight we're going to look at uh, tongues, the gift of tongues. It's uh, one of the spiritual gifts. And uh, it gets to be kind of controversial at times. People get caught up with uh, the meaning of tongues. And we see it's, it's referred to three times in the New Testament in the Mark, Acts, and 1 Corinthians. And um, you know, Mark is at the end of Mark there in, in chapter 16. And also, then we see in the book of Acts, it's mentioned, of course, at Pentecost, which was a known language. We can, it's obvious there. And different places in uh, the book of Acts, it's mentioned a few times. But always keep in mind when we look at the book of Acts that it's a transition book uh, between the Gospels and the, the Epistles. So, uh, tonight, we're just going to look at 1 Corinthians. And that's where the, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, we will say, display or discussion of it is. And it's, uh, Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, because this is a carnal church. I mean, uh, if you want to pick a church that had about everything going wrong and doing everything wrong, it was uh, the church of Corinth. They was caught up into uh, which one they're going to worship, which one they're going to, who was I baptized by, who was it, but all these different things. And so, uh, looking at the spiritual gifts, so, and that's what we're looking at here. These Over in chapters 12, 13, and 14 in First Corinthians, we see the, the spiritual gifts and the uh, and just looking over, I'm going to start off in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And just to take a look at that first uh, first verse there. He says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, uh, brethren, so we know he's talking to believers there, I would that would not have you ignorant. Okay, now that's, uh, sometimes people say you're ignorant and it, 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 people get offended. But the, the word ignorant here has the idea you not you don't know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, how the body all functions, you know, all the arteries and the blood vessels, I'm ignorant. I don't know how that stuff works. You got to have a general idea, but just, I don't know. I'm ignorant of that. And so to be ignorant of something means that you can change. All you have to do is get into it and study it or be taught it, and uh, then you you gain knowledge. And that's what Paul is writing to this church at Corinth. They've, uh, they're abusing uh, the gifts. Uh, they get it all mixed up on that, and they're trying to uh, get the gifts that are more... Um, uh, appealing, uh, more noticeable, and so he says here, I want you, uh, now concerning spiritual gifts, and we have those gifts, remember when we get saved, we're given at least one spiritual gift, uh, some believe you get more than one, but we know we get at least one, and he says here, concerning spiritual gifts, brother, I would not have you ignorant, so he's going to teach them, and uh, tell them just how the, the gifts, how the gift of tongues is to be used, how it's to be administered, so let me turn my watch off here real quick, it's just buzzing on me. Get that beeper off. There we go. So uh, the idea is then we're going to look at uh, the tongues now. So we're going to see, uh, we want to look at the Bible. We believe in the literal translation of the Bible. God says what he means and he means what he says. I know that when we get into eschatology, into the prophecy, over especially Revelation, uh, we see some of, the, some of the things that aren't to be taken literally. They're more symbolic. But basically as we get into the letters, that we can take them literally. And that's what we're doing here um, I hear I've had people talk to me about that they've they've spoken in tongues and that they they were in their closet praying and they went and started speaking in tongues and all those things and and it's like uh, people that say they have dreams, you know. Uh, I wasn't there. I can't argue with it. I don't know what happened. Uh, they experienced something. Uh, those that have dreams, they, they dream to go to heaven. They dream to go to hell. And uh, you know. Is that real or not real? Well, I know that it's not real in a real sense, but did they have the dream? Uh, who am I to say? So, but what I always do is when somebody asks me about a dream or about anything like that, <clears throat> what does the Bible say? How, how, is it, how does it line up with the Bible? And one of the more um, uh, verses, I, I portions of uh, scripture that are more informative, I think, is when Paul uh, goes to heaven, the third heaven, and when he comes back, he's the thorn in the flesh. And so God just doesn't do that. He just doesn't send everybody to heaven or anybody to hell just for an experience to see what it's like and then they get to come back. Uh, we're going to look at this portion of Scripture now looking at tongues and see what tongues is all about. Okay, so we're going to start over in uh, chapter 12. I'm going to turn over to verse uh, 28 to 31. So chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, it says here, and so we're looking at the gifts now, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities or different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, uh, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, 
But he says, but covet earnestly the, the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And in chapter 13, he's going to show us that excellent way. But I wanted to notice, as we looked at that, did you see here that how many times he said all? Okay, he says, first of all, he says that, uh, uh, this, for instance, are all apostles? Are, are all teachers? Are all miracle workers? Are all ha Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? See, he says it's not for everybody. Every gift, we don't get all the gifts, okay? So when it comes to tongues, and I've heard people say, if you can't speak in tongues, you're probably not saved. According to Scripture, not everybody can speak in tongues. And so when we get to that point, and remember now, he's not talking to the general population. He's talking to the church. So he's talking to people that are, are believers, and he's saying here, do all speak with tongues? And the Bible says, no, they don't all speak with tongues. That's not a gift for everybody in this day and time. Okay, and we'll get into how long this uh, gift is supposed to last and, and uh, how it was to be used a little bit more. But the idea is we see that it's it's not the most important gift. In fact, if we look at tongues, uh, it says here what it was tongues and interpretation of tongues was last in that list, wasn't it? So keep in mind again that the tongues isn't talked about throughout the the New Testament, throughout all the churches. It's hearing in uh, Corinthians, and he's writing and telling them because they were ignorant, they was misusing it. And in fact, we see that it fade out uh, pretty quickly. So we get a little bit further here. He says that uh, uh, the most and more excellent way is, is the way of love. And so I'm going to go down to chapter 13 now, 1 Corinthians, and we're going to look at the first nine verses, okay? He says, Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, where charity is love? I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, it's of no value. As though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it promised me not promised me nothing. I'll get it out there. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Uh, charity bondeth not itself, is not puffed, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. So look at all these things about love here as we're looking at it. He says, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, love, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there shall be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that, verse number 10 now, when, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So we're going to I stop right there. I read one extra verse there, then the verse 10. So what is he telling me there? He says that we get down to charity is not going to fail. Okay, as a Christian, love, charity is supposed to be a complete part of every part of our life. No matter what we're talking about, whether we're exercising spiritual gifts uh, effectively or whether we're doing something else in, a, in, a, in our job, the idea is that we're always to be doing it in love. In the good times, bad times, uh, up on the mountain, down the valley, whatever, we're always supposed to react to everything in love. So then we get a little bit farther. He said, it's not going to fail. But he says, whether it be prophecies or teachings, they shall fail. They're going to cease. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Okay. So the, the idea is, um, first of all, prophecies or teaching is going to be made useless. Okay. So when will prophecy or teaching be made useless? We're looking at just a moment. And he says that the tongues, um, they shall cease. In other words, uh, they'll be reduced. It means to, to reduce the inactivity to, um, uh, how else do I want to say that? They're, just, they're going to stop, okay? And then uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So now we go to verse 9 and we see what he reflects back on. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So if you notice what he's talking about there, a tongue is taken out of the picture. He's talked about three things there in verse number 8. Well, four if you want to count charity, but he says here that we know in part, we prophesy in part, but that which is when, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So we see what's going to be done away. Tongues are going to cease. All right, that's going to that's going to come to an end. And he says then we know in part and prophesy in part, but when that is perfect is come, then these two things are going to cease. So the controversy is, if you would. Uh, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So referring back now to knowledge and prophecy. So when, when would that happen? When would we ever get to the point that where we would uh, 
knowledge and prophecy would be finished, we wouldn't have it anymore. Okay, so when he says that which is perfect, in the Greek, he, the word perfect has the idea of a thing. It's not a person. So there's a couple schools of thought. Uh, one is that, that uh, when the Bible is completed, when it's perfect, when it's completed, the, all the 66 books are all put together, the canon, as we call it, is all completed, that is what is perfect. And so he says when that is done, when that's there, then we don't need the rest of it. But if I, if I refer back then to those other two things, the knowledge and, and the, um, uh, what was the talking about there, I go back to the knowledge and the prophecy, the knowledge and the teaching, he says, when will that cease? Well, that doesn't cease because I have the Bible. Because uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to teach. I'm going to continue to need those things uh, through, through the rest of our life. So what I'm looking at here, some believe it's when Jesus Christ returns. Okay, and then again, if you go to the Greek, it's talking about a thing, not a person. So how, how do we reconcile this? Well, when we stop and think about it, there's the millennium. When we come into that uh, that perfect age there when when we don't we want that eternal state when we don't need any more knowledge we won't need to know anymore uh, there won't be any more uh, knowledge or prophecy or teaching when that happens when the millennium gets here we don't need those anymore and so uh, you can kind of look at those that believe it's when Jesus returns well the, the return of Christ and the millennium go together don't they the second coming of Christ and the millennium. I don't believe he's talking about Christ there as the object of that word perfect, but I think that it's because Christ returned that we go into that time. And so they're so close. And when you read over in uh, Daniel, start taking the time of the tribulation and the time of the millennium, you see there's like a 75-day period in between those two. And so we think here that what he's talking about is the eternal state, the perfect. Because when we go into the millennium, you won't need any more teaching. You won't need to gain any more knowledge. We'll have all of those things because Christ will be here. Christ will be the ruler. So we get to, so if you can get past that part, okay, and that's where most folks that believe in uh, that believe in tongues, and you might be one of them that believe that tongues is for today. So they 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 would question that part. They wouldn't believe that part because they say, no, I speak in tongues. Well. What you speak in, I, I don't know, but I know that, uh, remember, tongues is a known language, and tongues is uh, for a certain time, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later here. So let's go a little bit further, and let's go over to, to uh, chapter 14, and verses 4 to 6, and so here we're going to see uh, the uh, what is to be done here as far as speaking in tongues. So go to chapter 14, verses 4 to 6. Uh, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So which is the most beneficial, Paul's going to talk about in just a minute. Is it teaching or is speaking in tongues the more uh, beneficial uh, to the church? And he says here, I would, I, I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. Okay, so we see the, interpret, the need for an interpreter that the church may receive edifying. Okay, so we, we see the difference here now, don't we? So he's saying here that if you speak with tongues, and you have to have an interpreter. I've heard uh, preachers get up and they'd be preaching and they, they rattle off some something gibberish-like and that nobody tells you what they said. Well, how do I know what he said? How do I know what it was? if that's true or not true? Because he's not speaking in a known language. And so there needs to be an interpreter. Every time we see tongues, you need to have an interpreter. And then verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? He says, uh, here's what he's talking about here. He says, the, the one that's speaking in tongues has a tendency to edify himself. Okay, when you're in the, when you're in the church among a bunch of people, he says, uh, and you're in the church house, and if you start speaking in tongues, you're, you're building yourself up, and that was the problem they had with that, with this gift at the church of Corinth. Everybody wants to speak in tongues. Everybody wants to be able to speak in tongues because they got the attention. So, so that's that's a misuse, and without the interpreter, without the interpreter, then it, you're not supposed to be speaking in tongues because it's of no value. So we go a little bit further here. So we want to have the right priority. Okay, same chapter, let's go over to verses eight, 18 and 19. It says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church. Okay, so I'm going to come here into the church house now. Yet in the church, I, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that my voice, I might, but that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul says, you know what? I can speak and speak and speak in tongues, but if it's of no, no value, I would rather speak five words that people can understand. 
what, which is more beneficial to you? Those things that uh, you understand or you don't understand. So Paul's saying right here, you need to have the right priorities. You need to be able to, to talk to people. Verse 26, I got here, it says, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down in his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you in truth. So we're seeing about having the right priority. Okay, uh, let's go a little bit further now. Sign in chapter 14, verse 21 to 23. It says, and the law is written with men of other tongues and other lips while I speak unto this a people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying, teaching, serveth not for them that believeth not, but for them which believe. So we see, so what side of the coin do we want to be on? He says, verse 23, there, I, If therefore the whole church come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in uh, those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? So what's he telling me there? He's saying that, that tongues are for a sign, what? For those that believe not. Okay? And just stop and think about when, when the first uh, demonstration of tongues back in the day of Pentecost, who received uh, the benefit of those those words spoken in tongues. Those that didn't believe. All those different nationalities, all those people out there who heard that in their own tongue and they come to know Christ. See, for the believers, what, what benefit? You know, I've been in churches and I've preached on a salvation message on how to be saved and what it means to be saved and those kind of things. And that's good that <laughs> Christian, we like to hear those things, but they don't help you grow. See, the Christian needs to hear the teaching of the Word of God. The unbeliever needs to hear the Gospel. And that's what Paul is saying. The purpose of the tongues is for the ones that don't believe. The teaching is for those that already believe. So we're going to be sure that we uh, get in mind what it's for, the purpose of tongues. If we go back over into to Romans chapter 12, he lists some gifts over there and don't even mention tongues. Remember, uh, 1 Corinthians is one of the earlier books written, so he's, Paul's dealing with that now. Okay, uh, tongues and other... Sign gifts. We go, there's other sign gifts. Remember, those for the, were the apostolic era. These were when the apostles were here. It showed that they were who they said they were. It showed an authority that they had that other people didn't have. And so when God gave them the gifts of healing and those kind of things. So when the apostolic era was over, when the times of the apostles had passed, we don't need those sign gifts anymore. All right, we still need the, the love and all these other gifts. We can talk about other gifts, the gift of helps and, the, and faith and all those things. We, we still need those, but the sign gifts aren't needed today. We have the Word of God, and we need that's all we need when it comes to these sign gifts to understand what it's all about. They were known languages. They were not for everybody. I guess some notes here I made that uh, there's a scriptural order for tongues in, in chapter 14 and verses 28. He says, uh, Verse 27 28, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or by, at the most by three, and that by a course, and let one interpret. Notice, you're going to have two or three people want to speak in tongues. They take their turn, okay, but you have an interpreter there to interpret what those three men are saying, <coughs> two or three or whatever there. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. In other words, keep it to yourself. Don't be, and God is not the author of confusion, okay? So when he, God wants things to be done in order, in a way that's going to be beneficial to the body of Christ and to those that don't know Christ. So when it comes to tongues, tongues are, are not a sign that you're saved. It's not everybody gets that gift. So when people say, if you can't speak in tongues, you're probably not even saved, and that's, that's not true. That's not scriptural. Again, we want to stick with what the Bible says. When the, the sign of the Tongues and prophesying and knowledge, those three things I talked about, tongues will cease. The other two are going to cease when that which is perfect is coming. We talked about that being a, the eternal state, Christ returning and going into the millennium. Okay, so if I have you any more confused than, than you were when you started, I don't know. But uh, to me, uh, too much emphasis is made on some of these things that, that and all it does, it brings attention to ourselves. You know, and uh, there's other things that people do that, that uh, bring attention to themselves other than tongues in churches that have to try to get attention. But the idea is what we keep in mind is we're a servant of the Most High God. We're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what everything we do, as he says over there in chapter 13, is to be done with love. I don't care what gift you have, whether it's in faith or helps or whatever, you do exercise that gift in love for everybody.
But first of all, what you have to have, you have to know Christ as your personal Savior. You have to have a personal relationship with the Father through the Son. Jesus said, that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. To get to the Father, you have to go through the Son. And how do I do that? I repent. I turn to God and put my faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as payment for my sin. Believing from my heart that that truly, that blood has reconciled me to God. That blood has redeemed me. That blood has saved me. And you'll have eternal life. And for those, of you, for those of us that are Christians, we need to keep in mind our responsibility to live out this Word of God in a way that draws others to Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and for this time, and we pray you be with each one of us. As we walk this pathway of life, Lord, we want to be found faithful to serve you in a way that honors and blesses you. And as we look at all the spiritual gifts, we know that some have ceased, but there's many gifts that still are out there that are given to believers. And we pray that whatever our gift is, we will exercise that gift in a way that will bring honor and glory and praise to you. We thank you for loving us, and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.